And it looks like we have a question already. So uh, uh, Jim's question, he says, uh, on Tuesday's call, the guest said a loan officer was providing an edge TCA on the open house so that the realtor could email the customer. If the email goes from the realtor, we can still see when it's open and viewed by the customer. Is that correct? Absolutely. As long as it's an edge link, uh, your edge link is tied to your account. So what happens is if you check the box to be notified, it doesn't matter who sends that link around or who clicks on it. You're going to get a notification that says that that report has been viewed. Now, if you also choose to enter the realtor's email address in the, in the referred by field, or I'm, I'm sorry, in the, in the realtor email address field, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, you, you will have an additional checkbox at the end of the presentation to notify the realtor as well. So when they send out that link, both of you will get notified. So I'll show you that when we get closer towards the end of uh, our presentation today, and uh, we'll make sure you can, you, can, uh, you can see where those are at. Okay, so first things first, for those of you who are brand new to Edge, Edge is a fully online tool. So to access Edge, you can go through any browser window, and you're just going to type in edge.mortgagecoach.com. And once you do, you're going to land at the login screen. Now, make sure and enter your email address, and then pop in your password and hit login. Now the first place you're going to land is going to be the home screen. So I'm going to take just a moment to explain what's on the home screen and what you can do with this. So first things first, you probably have a lot less clients in here if you're brand new, but there should be some sample presentations that are available. You'll see things like Jenny Renter or uh, I want to say it's John First Time or something like that. But these are all just sample presentations that we've pre-populated for you in your account. Uh, Feel free to peruse those, you know, check out how we did it so you can get an idea of how those presentations are put together. And feel free to modify them. If you want to change one of them to be one of your clients, feel free to do that and then just modify the data a little bit and you can use that report to send out. Now in order to edit any, any report inside Edge, you can either double click on the name of the client here and you can see that this is the recent client list that shows all the ones I've done, probably the last 10 or 15 or so. But if you're not seeing the one in your list that you want, you can actually go to the View All tab. So when you click on View All, this is going to bring up a list of all your clients. And you can now filter, this is basically a search filter, uh, your clients down based on what it's called. So for instance, if I wanted to find anything that had sample in it, you can see I just started typing sample, and I've got a bunch of sample clients in here that I've created. Um, if I wanted to go in and edit one of these, say for instance this refi primary, I would select the actual report you notice there's a little arrow next to the borrower's name. I would select the actual report and I can hit open analysis and that's going to bring me back to the editor so that I can change values in there. Now for today's discussion I'm going to start from scratch and we're just going to do a basic purchase analysis because this is the most common presentation you'll be doing. Now oftentimes your borrower is only going to qualify for one type of loan so I'm going to show you what to do when that's the scenario you know when you don't have multiple loans to compare against because you definitely do need to have at least two loans on this presentation in order for the the comparisons to make sense. So let me close out of here and I'm going to start a brand new client. So to do that you're going to click on the new client button up in the top. Now if you'd like to you can follow along with me if you'd like to log into your edge feel free to reduce the screen that you're looking at right now in GoToMeeting and bring open a browser and log into edge. I'm going to actually instruct you on exactly what to put in so we're going to build this together. So if you're doing that I'll give you just a moment op open up a browser if you've got two screens that's even better because you can open up a browser on your second screen and you can watch what I'm doing and do what you're doing. But uh, Hopefully all of you have a browser window open at this point. So you're going to click on New Client. Now New Client, this is just a blank record. So what we're going to do is we're going to start populating this with some basic information. Now for today's sample presentation, I'm going to tell you what to enter. So for the first name field, I'd like you to use my name. It's going to be Jacob. So type in J-A-C-O-B. And then go to the last name field and type in Gibbs, G-I-B-B-S. Now home phone number, don't worry about it for right now. We don't need to enter that on this one. This is just going to be a sample file. But I do want to explain a couple of things about the radio buttons that are just underneath the home phone line. There's a question asking, is this a client or prospect? Now the difference between those is a client is somebody who you've worked with in the past. A prospect is just somebody who's new. You haven't worked with them before. Now it doesn't do anything to your Edge presentation either way, depending on which one you choose, but we're going to be adding some additional filtering later down the line that's going to allow you to look at just clients or just prospects. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of tagging these as, as to what they are. So for today's discussion, you're going to tag this one as prospect. So go ahead and click on the prospect radio button. 
Now we're going to do a total cost analysis and in order to do that we're actually going to leave this radio button selected that says does he or she rent or own we're going to leave that selected on own because that's going to guide us through a total cost analysis now if we had selected rent here the wizard is going to guide us through a rent versus own so for today since we don't want to do a rent versus own we're just going to leave it at own even if this is a first time home buyer and they don't own any property leave it at own so it tells the wizard where to go now referred by this is where you want to put the name of the person that referred you so if you're working with uh, Joe Realtor you're going to type in Joe Realtor in that, in that uh, field. So everybody please type in Joe Realtor in the referred by field. Now the next field is the partner email. Now partner email, as, as we were saying earlier when I was answering Jim's question, the partner email is very important. If you want your partner to be notified when this presentation is viewed, you need to make sure to put an email in here. For today's discussion, what I'd like you to do for this scenario is I'd like you to put in one of your secondary emails. So not, not the one that you use for Edge, but let's say you have a Yahoo address or a Gmail address or something like that, because I want you to get the experience of what the realtor would see when, when this presentation is opened. So everybody in the partner email line, type in one of your secondary email addresses. Now the friendly name field. The friendly name field is very important for identifying your presentations. As you noted earlier when we were looking at the view all tab, when you look at the specific presentations inside Edge, they'll always be marked with a date and time stamp. That just shows you when the last time was that you accessed the file. Now that being said, if you do include a friendly name, that friendly name will show up right next to the date and time stamp. So keep in mind this is not a nickname for your client, this is a nickname for your presentation. So in this one, I'm going to call it Purchase Options. So I'd like you all to type in Purchase Options in the Friendly Name field. Now once you do that, go ahead and click on the right arrow. And this is going to take you to the Goals section. Now for a purchase presentation, we do want to select Purchase a New Home. So go ahead and click the box Purchase a New Home. Now this one actually has logic behind it that says don't ask for current mortgage questions. We're not doing a refi, we're doing a purchase. So when you click this box, you're going to notice that the screens going forward are slightly different. We're not going to ask you for a first payment date. We're not going to ask you for the rate and term of their current mortgage. We're just going to ask you for basics that are going to help you develop a purchase scenario. So everybody, please check the Purchase a New Home box. And then click on the right arrow. Now we get into assumptions, and you can see that there's some current mortgage questions in here, but they're in black, which means you don't need to fill them in if, if it's not part of your presentation. The one field you do want to fill in on this page is going to be the property value slash purchase price field. So for today's discussion, we're going to do a property valued at 300000 So please type in 300000 Now we're not going to do the Freddie or Fannie lookups, but I do want to make you aware that they're there. This is going to allow you to look up a current mortgage that they have if, uh, if you're doing a refinance transaction uh, to find out if it's Fannie or Freddie owned. But we're not going to do that for today's discussion, so you can go ahead and hit the right arrow. Now everybody should be on the affordability screen. This is the fourth tab in the Edge Wizard, and the affordability screen, notice that there's no fields in here that are in red, which means you don't have to fill in all these fields. However, they're great fields to collect. These are the fields, especially when you're pre-qualifying a borrower, that are going to help you decide on what particular loan package is going to be right for them. So we're going to go ahead and fill out these fields today. For annual gross income, I'd like you to put in $75,000. Now when you get to the credit, credit status, you'll notice that we're not collecting FICO scores here we're actually just getting an idea of what the client feels their credit is. So when you're, when you're taking the application, when you're talking to your borrower over the phone, you're already asking these questions. So all you're doing here is you're plugging them into the Edge Wizard so you have an idea of what their situation is. For today's discussion under credit status, please hit the drop down arrow and then select Good. Now we're going to collect a little bit, a little bit of information from our borrower about their non-mortgage debts. We want to know what their, what their, uh, what their total DTI is going to be. So in order to generate that, we're going to need to put in how much debt they have and what their monthly payment would be. So for the total non-mortgage debt, please put in five thousand dollars. Now when you go to the next field, this is asking for the monthly payment that's associated with that debt. Go ahead and put in five hundred dollars, please. 
Now it's automatically toggled as monthly there. Um, I would advise you always keep it on monthly. There's really never a reason to put in an annual payment there. Uh, so just leave it at monthly and uh, we're going to move to the savings balance line. Now to explain what the savings balance lines are, these are indicating what they currently have in the bank. So we need to isolate that they have enough funds to close the transaction. So for today, I want you to put in $20,000. And then for the rate of return, this is going to be the rate they're getting on that savings account. Now if this is just a, a bank savings account, it's probably pretty low. So go ahead and put 0.5%. So you don't need to type the percent sign, but type in 0.5. Now we get to the tax bracket field. Now, one of the things about the tax bracket field is that if you leave it empty, the tax benefit will not show up on your presentation at all. And it's up to you as to whether you want to show this or not. Just remember, if you are going to show tax benefit, make sure you've got something in your disclaimer or in your payment notes that says, you know, consult your CPA or tax advisor for more details on the tax benefit, something like that. Basically, you just don't want to represent yourself as a tax professional when, in fact, all we're trying to do is educate the borrower on the potential tax benefit. So for tax bracket, we can find this person's tax bracket fairly easily. So what I'd like you to do is hit the button that says Find Tax Bracket. Now this is going to open up a new page that has a very basic diagram of what the incomes are and what those relate to in terms of tax bracket. Now we're going to leave the filing status at single and just look down the page just slightly and you'll see that the third row between 36.9 and 89.350 is 25 percent. So we know we're going to use 25 percent for our tax bracket. So go ahead and click on your edge tab again. So up at the very top click on mortgage coach edge so it brings you back to the wizard. Then in the tax bracket field, type in 25. This is another field that's automatically a percentage, so you don't need to put a percent sign there. Now the tax credits button, I'm going to explain what that is real quick, but we're not going to go into detail and we're not going to leave it on this presentation because it's a very specific program that's only available through certain lenders. The tax credits allows you to apply the MCC credit. Now that's a mortgage credit certificate. Now MCC allows the borrower to write up a certain chunk of interest to write off a certain chunk of interest as a credit. So this is not just a regular deduction, this is a credit against you know, um, usually a percentage of the interest they're paying every month. It also has a cap. So if you click on tax credits right now, just so you can see the data entry here, we ask you for the tax credit percentage, and this varies from state to state, so you'll want to check your guidelines, check with your lenders and find out if this is available, one, and two, what the, what the caps are. Now in California, we have a 30% limit, so they can, they can credit up to 30% of the annual interest, and there's a maximum that they, they can take. So here in California, it's 30 and 3,000. But we're going to leave that, that annual tax credit percentage field blank, because we're not going to apply the MCC credit on this report. So go ahead and hit the cancel button so it'll close out the tax credits window. Then I'd like everybody to hit the right arrow, and we're going to proceed to the next screen. Now this is the part where you've probably already asked your borrower and you have a good idea of what they're looking to get. You know, the, the maximum mortgage payment and ideal mortgage payment, you know, we want to find out the range of what they think they can afford. So for today, uh, for the maximum, let's put in $2,500. And then ideal payment, let's put $2,000. Now we're going to collect the price ranges that they're interested in looking at. So we already know we've decided that we're going to do a $300,000 uh, purchase price here, but what if the borrower has told you, you know, I can probably go anywhere between 290 and 310. So that's what we're going to use. For the low, put in 290,000. And for the high, put in 310,000. Now there's going to be no cash out in this situation, so go ahead and leave the desired cash out line blank, and then you're going to hit the right arrow. Now we've, co we've completed the data collection process. So all the early fields were done and now it's, time, now it's time to focus on what kind of products we're going to position for this client. Now in today's case, let's assume that you know, they're, they're really only going to qualify for an FHA loan or maybe they don't have enough money to really come in with a large down payment that they would be required for 10 or 20% down. So what we're going to do is for this product, we're going to make it an FHA. So for the name of the product, I'd like you to call it FHA 30 fixed. And I'm using an abbreviation FXD. Feel free to write the whole thing out if you'd like. 
Now once you've entered the name for the product, you'll notice that there's radio buttons right beneath it asking, is this a refi? This is not a refi, so we're going to leave it toggled at no. Now there's a current mortgage checkbox that's right next to that no selection. We're going to leave that unchecked. Matter of fact, there's never a time when you want to manually check that. The only time that box should ever be checked is when you're doing a resubordination. So for instance, you've got a first and second, and you're just going to refi the first and keep the second. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to copy the current mortgages into a new product slot, and you're going to overwrite the first mortgage with your new one, but you're going to leave the second the same, and it'll have that current checkbox checked for you. For today's discussion, do not check the current mortgage box. Now, beneath that, you'll see that there's a line called Add Product from Template. If you've already saved product templates, this will allow you to, to basically pull down a template that fills out the entire loan product, everything from the loan details to the closing costs, to the monthly escrows. For today, we're going to do it from scratch, so no need to pull down a template, but I do want to make you aware of that feature. Now we're going to copy, we're, we're actually going to cover the copy from button when we get to our next loan product, so I'll defer on that one for now. But the next selection here is, is this a VA or FHA program? And basically what this means is, is this a government program? It could also be a USDA, uh, but basically what this does is it opens up in the next screen a field that allows you to enter the upfront MIP. So go ahead and check, yes, this is an FHA program. Now you'll notice that uh, you have data entry areas that allow you to, to put in the specifics of the loan. Now by default, it starts off with allowing you to enter the down payment as a dollar amount. It's usually easier to enter it as a percentage though. So in order to do that, I'd like you to click the percentage button right next to that field. You'll notice it grays out the down payment and base loan amount. So now you can actually enter on the right side three and a half so type in 3.5 and when you go to the next tab so basically you can either hit the tab button on your keyboard or you can take your mouse and click on say the interest rate line you'll see that it updates the down payment line and the base loan amount to be down payment of 10.5 and base loan of 289.5 for the interest rate field let's put in 4.5 Now for the term, we do collect the term in months, so keep this in mind, uh, we want to enter 360 here. Uh, if you ever find out that your monthly payment just looks incredibly high, like a $20,000 payment, you've probably entered this in years instead of months, say putting a 30 instead of 360, so that would be the first thing to check is see what your term is. Uh, but for today, go ahead and enter that 360. Now we're going to leave the loan type as fixed, but what this does, if you guys go ahead and click on the loan type drop down, it gives you the option to select whether it's a fixed loan or an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, again, for today, we're going to leave it at fixed, but if we did select ARM, it's going to actually ask us for all the caps and adjustment parameters for that ARM in the next screen. So leave it on fixed for now. Now interest only months, this is if there is an interest only period for this particular loan, you'd want to tell Edge how long that I.O. period is. So for, for example, if this was a 10 year I.O. loan, you'd want to put in 120 in there. For today, we're going to leave it blank. This is not an interest-only loan, so leave the zero in there. Now, months to balloon payment, this really only applies to seconds most of the time. Um, when you have, say, a 30-year loan that's due in 15 years, uh, that's when you would put the 180 here for when that balloons and requires the payoff. So for today, leave it blank. We're not going to do a balloon on this one. And then you're going to hit the right arrow. Now we get into the closing cost details. So first things first, let's deal with the upfront MIP down at the very bottom. Now we don't want to enter this as a dollar percentage because it's a lot easier to use just a regular percentage. I'm sorry, we're not going to enter it as a dollar amount. We'll use the percentage. So click on the percentage button there right next to the upfront MIP field, and you'll see it opens up a field on the right. Enter 1.75. Then hit the tab key on your keyboard. And you'll see that this has opened up a new checkbox just beneath it that allows you to finance this into the loan. Go ahead and check the box to add the upfront MI to the loan amount. This has now increased our total amount financed from that original base loan amount to the original base loan amount plus the upfront MIP. Now let's deal with closing costs. There's two ways to do them. Right now, you can actually enter these as ballpark fees if you'd like to. You could, if you know that your APR fees are going to be around $2,500, you can put that in there, and so on and so forth all the way down the line. Now, remember, this is all pre-GFE, so it doesn't have to be absolutely spot on, and you want to make sure and relay that to your client if you're going to use ballpark figures. 
The other side of the equation is detailing the line items. So for today, we're going to detail the line items. I'd like you to hit the Closing Cost Detail button at the very top of the screen. Now this opens up the itemization. So today what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a very basic set of fees and I'm going to have you save it as a template so that you can reuse it, modify it to whatever your fees are. But the easiest way to get your fees into the program is print out a GFE or a fee worksheet from a transaction that you've closed recently. And then you're going to actually look at that, that fee worksheet and you're going to mirror those fees in here. And you can do that by hitting the Add Fee button over and over and over again and then selecting the appropriate fee and putting in the dollar amount. So everybody hit the Add Fee button one time. Now you'll see that this is, this is giving you a new line item. So the first thing we're going to choose is we're going to hit the drop down and that's that little arrow pointing down right next to where it says Admin Fee. We're going to hit the drop down and you'll see that there's a bunch of different fees in here. And we've recently added quite a few more. We added about 40 new fees in here uh, just because people had different nomenclature on, uh, on what they called their fees. So there's all kinds of them in here. Now, if you, if you want to search by the first character of your fee name, for instance, if you want to put the credit report here, type C and you'll see that it now sorts by the C's. And you can hit the uh, little down arrow to scroll it down until you get to the credit report. Then left click on credit report. So everybody choose credit report for that first line item. And just to the right of that you'll see that there's a percentage field. We're not going to do a percentage on this one. This is going to be a static dollar amount. So I'd like you to enter what you charge for a credit report. It's probably about 25 or 30 bucks. Whatever you'd like to put there, go ahead and enter that dollar figure. Now to the right, we, we actually have to assign who's paying this. Is the borrower paying it? Are you paying it? Is a broker paying it? Um, for today's discussion, we're going to leave it at borrower, but I would like you to click the drop down arrow so you can see that you have a selection on who's paying this particular fee. Now go ahead and hit that drop down arrow again and it'll collapse back in. And you'll see there's three boxes to the right of that field. You've got an APR box, you've got an add to loan box, and you've got a PPE box. Now the APR one is exactly what you expect. It's just to tell Edge whether this is an APR fee or not. Now credit report is a non-APR fee, so we're going to leave that unchecked. Add to loan means are we going to be taking this fee and padding the loan amount with this fee to cover it? Now for purchase transactions, you're usually not going to do this, but on most refi transactions you would. For today, leave the add to loan checkbox unchecked. Now the final checkbox here is PPE. Now what that stands for is prepaid escrows. These are for your reserves, so your hazard insurance reserves, your tax reserves, MI reserves. Those are the ones where you would check this box. Now the credit report is not a prepaid escrow, so we're going to leave that unchecked. Now it's time to add another line item. So go ahead and click the Add Fee button one more time. Now you're going to hit the drop down arrow on that one and you're already in the A's and we're actually going to choose appraisal. So if you scroll down the list just slightly you'll see there's one called appraisal fee. Left click on appraisal fee to select it. Then in the dollar amount field I'd like you to indicate how much it costs for the appraisal. I'm going to enter $700. If you don't know what you're charging for an appraisal go ahead and use 700 there. Now this is going to be paid by borrower so we're going to leave it as paid by borrower. We're going to leave the APR checkbox unchecked because APR or appraisal is a non-APR fee. We're not going to check the add to loan and we're not going to check PPE. Now let's add an additional fee. Hit the add fee button once again. Now you're going to click on the drop down arrow and type L on your keyboard. This takes you to where you can select loan origination. Left click on loan origination to select it. Now for the loan origination, if you, know, if you have a static origination fee, you can put that fee in here. Uh, if you normally charge on a percentage basis, you'll see that the percentage is, is actually grayed out on this one. And the reason is Edge doesn't know what the total amount financed is yet. So if you were doing a refi transaction, this would be based on the wrong percentage. So what I'd like you to do here is if you do have a static fee, go ahead and enter that. If you don't, I'd like you to enter 2800 Now we're going to leave this as borrower paid, but this is an APR fee. So go ahead and check the APR checkbox. Now let's add another fee. So go ahead and hit the Add Fee button. 
and we're going to use the drop down and we're going to do the title insurance now. So I'd like you to type in O. This is going to take you over to where you can select owner's title insurance. Now for the dollar amount there, put in $400. Now usually owner's title is covered by the seller. So what we're going to do is on the paid by line, we're going to hit the drop down and instead of the borrower, we're going to select seller. And you'll see that now in the blue line in the middle of the page, it's updating to show that the seller is paying $400 of this. Let's add another fee. So hit add fee one more time. Now we're going to do the lender's title insurance. So hit the drop down and type an L. And it should be the top option for you. Left click on that one to select it. And let's put in, say, $500 there. This is a non-APR fee, so we're going to leave the APR checkbox unchecked. Now hit Add Fee again. Now for this one, we're going to do a notary fee. So hit the drop down, type an N on your keyboard, and it should be the first selection there. Left click on Notary Fee to select it. Now if you know what your notary fee is, go ahead and enter the exact dollar amount for that. If you don't know what your notary fee is, put 100 there. Now you'll need to check with your, your compliance and your lock desk to find out if notary fee is in fact an APR item for you. I've seen it both ways. For today's discussion, I'm going to check it as a notary fee, I'm, as an APR fee. So go ahead and check the APR box if you don't know. Uh, if you do know for a fact one way or the other with your company, uh, do so accordingly. Now let's hit Add Fee one more time. And for this one, we're going to select Pest Inspection. So click on the drop down and choose a P. You'll see that there is a pest inspection fee there. Now, if you know what your pest, pest inspection fees are, go ahead and put it in there. Um, I'm going to put 200 for mine. And that is a non-APR box, so we're going to leave that one unchecked. Uh, Jim's question, real quick here. Uh, he says, on the loan origination fee where you get the, the gray box, uh, can you put it in the points for the cost of the loan? Absolutely, and that's a great idea, Jim. Um, and I'll show everybody that. Once we finish out uh, this itemization, I'll show you a second way you can do the loan origination um, to do it as a percentage. I know a lot of you do use percentages. Uh, so what you would do in this case is leave loan origination blank. So uh, you'd have a $0 amount there, and you're just going to use the points field to indicate your origination charges. But I'll show you that in just a moment. But great idea there, Jim. Uh, definitely is a workable uh, option. Now, another option, uh, you can kind of trick the system, Jim, by adding a custom fee, calling it loan origination, making it an APR fee, and it'll actually allow you to use a percentage on that. Just make sure that when you create that custom fee, call it loan origination purchase or something like that so you don't use it for a refi. Because if you do use it for a refi and you've rolled in other fees, that percentage is going to be wrong. Okay, so we've just finished the pest inspection line. Uh, if you don't know what your pest inspection is, put in 200 there. This is a non-APR fee, so we're going to leave the box unchecked. Now we're going to add three more fees. So hit the Add Fee button three times. Now on that first one that you just added, click on the drop-down arrow and type R. We want to get to the recording fees. So go ahead and select Recording and then put in $100 there if you don't know what your recording fees are and we're gonna leave that blank for the APR checkbox sorry now the next one that says admin fee this is where we're gonna do our reserves so I'd like you to hit the drop down arrow and type in H and you're gonna see that there's hazard insurance premium hazard insurance reserves we're gonna do hazard insurance reserves so please select that this is another one where you can see that it's grayed out the percentage here now, eventually, and this is coming pretty soon because we have our dev team working on it right now, we're going to be giving you a way that you can do a number of months for these. Right now, it's not possible because we don't know what the monthly fees are yet. Um, so what you're going to have to do is you need to manually put these in on a case-by-case -case basis. So for today's discussion for the hazard insurance fees, uh, let's, or for the reserves, let's put in 250 there. And if you look to the right, you'll see that Edge has automatically checked that prepaid escrow box for you. So we want to leave that checked. Now let's go to the last fee line item. For this one, hit the drop down arrow and select or type in T on your keyboard. And you'll see that there's a taxes reserves. Go ahead and select that one. And enter $700 for that category. And same thing, we're going to leave the PPE box checked. 
Um, we, you see that the APR boxes are actually grayed out. You can't check them. Uh, the reason is the prepaid escrows are never going to be APR line items. So um, once you check the PPE box, it will gray out that APR box. So now we've got a very basic uh, fee schedule set up in here. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to save this as a template. So go down to the very bottom of your screen and click on Save as Template. This is going to bring up a new fee template area where you can provide the name of your template. So for today, we're going to call this Sample Template or Sample Purchase Template is what I'd like you to call it. Now, if you do, if you do choose to select a state, what that means is that this template will only be available when you select that particular state at the top of your closing cost details. You guys see a state indicator up at the very top there. If you leave the state blank when you're creating your templates, it'll be available no matter what state you've selected or if you've selected no state at all. So for the most part, I would tell you, you're probably going to leave the state field blank unless you've got specific fee templates that you need to assign to a particular state because the fees are just so much different from others. So leave the state designation blank for now and click the OK button. You now have a fee template that you can use going forward. And I'm going to show you towards the end of the call where you can go in and edit these templates. So click OK after you've saved the template and you are now back into that fee detail. Now I want to show you one more thing before we exit out of here. I want to show you how to do a contribution. So everybody hit the add fee button one more time. Now in the drop down area, you're going, to type, you're going to click on the drop down and then hit C on your keyboard. Now you're going to need to scroll down just a tad, but you'll see one in there called contribution. This is the only one in the list that has logic behind it that says we need to knock down the cash to close by whatever amount you put in here. If you were to create a custom fee and call it seller contribution, it's just going to say that the seller is paying that fee. It's not going to knock down the cash to close. So when you want to do a contribution, select contribution here, and then let's put in a $1,500 contribution. And let's attribute it to the lender. Now you'll notice that in the blue area, your total borrower paid fees have now dropped to $3,785. You're showing lender paid fees of $1,500 and you're showing seller paid fees of 400. Uh, Brian's question, how do you enter interest rate premium that brokers credit to the borrower? Uh, so you can do it two ways. Uh, if you, 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 you can actually use the contribution line if you want, if it's going to be credited to the borrower because we want it to knock down their cash to close. Or you can enter it as a custom line item and uh, call it like uh, interest rate credit or something like that. Put in the amount of it and then attribute it to the broker. So uh, that there's two different ways to do that. It just depends on whether you want it to knock down cash to close. You would use contribution for that. Or if you're just saying that this is a fee that's paid by somebody else, in which case do the custom and then attribute it to the broker. Now you'll notice that on contributions, you have the option of checking the APR box if you want to. So this is going to tell Edge whether to apply this contribution to the APR fees or the non-APR fees. Check your GFEs on this one because you want, to, you want to determine whether a particular program that you're doing, is if that credit is supposed to knock down APR fees or not. Oftentimes, it's really not supposed to affect the APR, so definitely look into it. But if you're doing no-cost loans, uh, specifically doing no-cost loans, you would want to check this APR box so it knocks down the APR fees. For today's discussion, go ahead and check the APR box. Now I'd like everybody to hit Apply to Loan. Now once you get back into your screen here, you'll notice that a lot of these fields are grayed out. That's because they're being pre-populated by the data entry that you did inside the detail. But as Jim noted earlier, there's two fees that are still open, or two line items that are still open. There's points, which you can use this for your origination points if you want to. Just don't double dip and put them, put them in both places. Uh, but absolutely you can put it in. So for instance, 0.85 is my origination fee. I type that in, and I'd like everybody to put in a percentage there just for a second. We're going to delete it out of there in a moment, but I'd like you to see what it does. Uh, so type in 0.85 there, and then tab off that field using the tab key on your keyboard or just clicking onto another field. Now hover your mouse over that points value there, over the 0.85, and you're going to see it shows you the total dollar amount that equates to that, and that's come out to 2503.81. 
So just wanted to show you that. Go ahead and select that value and type a zero over it to delete it. Now we need to make sure and put in our prepaid interest days. So type in 15 there. That's usually what you're going to use. And you'll notice when you tab off that field, you do have the option to add that to the loan amount. Again, that's only for refinance transactions. You're not going to use this for purchases. So leave the box unchecked. So we are done with our closing cost screen. Now everybody hit the right arrow, and this is going to take you to the monthly costs area. Now monthly costs, I like doing these as factor percentages. And the reason I do this is because when I save this as a template, I want those factor percentages to generate my hazard insurance and property taxes for me. I don't want to have to try and guess at dollar amounts every time. So in order to open up those percentage fields, on the hazard insurance line, click on the percentage button right in the middle. Now this can vary depending on where you're at, how much the hazard insurance is. I know it varies pretty widely here in California. In Southern California, we use a 0.35 percentage, but in Northern California, it's closer to 0.2. So you can easily find out what your percentages are by grabbing an old GFE or an old fee worksheet and eyeballing that hazard insurance. Prepare the exact same loan inside Edge and then use a percentage and narrow it down until you get the right dollar amount. That's the percentage you want to use going forward on your presentations. Now for today's discussion, I'd like everybody to put 0.35. Now we get to the property tax line. Click on the percentage button so it'll open up the percentage field. Now here in California we use 1.25, but it may be different in your state. Um, for today's discussion, please enter 1.25, unless you know specifically what your, what your tax percentage is in your area, in which case go ahead and use the one that you know is correct. Now you'll see that by doing that, we now have populated our hazard insurance and our property tax amounts using those factor percentages. Now this is going to come in real handy when we do our next product because we're going to do a different purchase price and uh, we'll show them what, what happens with that. And it's automatically going to adjust the hazard insurance and the taxes based on that new loan program. Now the other field here, what this is for is that this allows you to assign any other kind of monthly cost that you want to show here. Now, oftentimes, I've seen people use this for putting uh, a, a debt. Say, if they want to show a pity payment with a debt inside of it, say, for instance, a credit card debt, they'll put credit card. They can literally type over other, if you'd like, and put in whatever that monthly amount is. And it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like it's part of the pity payment. And they do that for when they want to show a debt payoff so that the new payment won't have this, this other monthly fee. For today, leave the other fee blank. Now we're going to get to mortgage insurance. Now for mortgage insurance, especially on FHA loans, you have to enter this as a percentage. So click on the percentage button. And then in the percentage line, I'd like you to put in 1.35. That's what current FHA guidelines say the, uh, the factor percentage is for the high LTV FHA loans. Now if you need a refresher on FHA guidelines, we have a pretty cool little chart we can send you that just shows you, hey, at 90% LTV, they're responsible for MI for 132 months, here's the factor percentage, that kind of thing. So if you need that, um, shoot us a quick note over at support at mortgagecoach.com and we can get that out to you. Now MI cutoff percentage. This really comes into play more for conventional loans because FHA loans require it for the life of the loan so that the percentage doesn't really matter. So for today's discussion, just leave the 78 there. It's not going to come into play at all. But very, very important for FHA loans, for any government loan for that, for that matter, uh, the Calc MI on balance checkbox just to the right of that cutoff percentage, you want to check that. And you'll notice that that changes your monthly mortgage insurance. Now what this does is this tells Edge that it's a government loan. So it's actually going to recalculate the MI payment every year based on the last 12 months outstanding balance. This is how your loan origination system does it too. And if you weren't aware of this, MI declines over the life of the loan on, on an FHA program. So while it may be $323 for the first payment, by the time they get to the end of the loan, it's something like $20 or $30. It's declined that much because the balance keeps going down. So there's a huge stigma around FHA loans because they have to carry MI for the life of the loan, but most people just aren't aware of that declining MI. You know, it's really only a problem for the first 10 years, and then after that, it starts going down pretty significantly. So everybody click the box that says Calc MI on balance. And then we're going to go to the MI cutoff month field. Now, this is pretty important. We have to tell Edge it has to carry for the life of the loan on this product. So I'd like everybody to type in 360. 
Now, the MI tax deductible box, um, as far as I know, it's not going to be deductible right now. Uh, they vote on it every year, so we're going to leave it in there for you. Uh, <laughs> but I'd say for now, you want, you, want to leave, <laughs> excuse me, you want to leave this unchecked as it will not be a <coughs> deductible amount. Okay, sorry about that. A little cough there. All right, so we've completed our first product. Now, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to save this as a product template. Now, we already saved a fee template. I want you to save the entire product now so you can easily bring back this template anytime you need it. In order to do that, click the button at the bottom that says Save as Template. And this is automatically going to put in the name for the template as FHA 30 Fixed. You can leave it like that. If you want to rename it, you can. But once you've got the name the way you want it, click on OK. And this is going to tell you that this template has been saved. Now we have two different types of templates that we've saved on this one product. We have a fee template that just describes purchase fees. And then we have a product template that has all three of these screens in it. So it's got the basic loan details from the first screen of the product. It's got the closing costs from the second screen of the product. And it's got the monthly costs from this third screen of the product that we're on right now. So now everybody hit add another product. Now you can see that we're now on product two. So for this situation, remember I said this borrower really only qualifies for one type of loan or he's only got a little bit of money. So we can't just show him only the FHA loan. And we're not necessarily going to show him a conventional at 10% down because he just can't afford it. So what do we do in this situation? Well, there's a couple of ideas here. One is you can show them what would happen if they brought in a little extra money to pay down the rate, to buy down the rate. Another option is show them a different purchase price. Show them what they could do with a slightly greater or lesser priced property. So for today's discussion, we're going to show them a different purchase price. Now remember, our original purchase price was $300,000. So let's show them what a 310 purchase looks like. So for the product name, I'd like you to type in FHA 30 and then abbreviate fixed FXD, then type 310K. So this is an FHA 30 fixed, 310,000. Now the next step is I'm going to show you what this copy button does. We did all that legwork on the first product and we don't need to do it on the second. We can copy all of it. So everybody click on the copy from button. And then it should have already selected FHA 30 fixed for you. So leave that selection and hit OK. Now you'll see that this has filled out the entire product for you. All we need to do is change that purchase price. So everybody on the purchase price line, instead of 300, type in 310, well, $310,000. And you'll notice that once you tab off that field, it's adjusted the down payment and the base loan amount. It's a little bit higher than the other one. We're going to leave the rate the same. We're going to assume we can get the exact same rate on this one. And go ahead and click on the right arrow. Now, because we used that copy function, it already copied our upfront MIP. It copied all of our fees. The only thing we would probably want to go in and modify on this one is the hazard and tax reserves because it's going to be slightly more based on this new, new purchase price. So everybody click on closing cost detail. And then you're going to scroll to the bottom where you have your reserves. And under hazard insurance reserves, put 275. Under tax reserves, put 800. Now hit apply to loan. Now we're done with our fees. It copied everything over for us, so we just had to make those minor mods and we're good to go. Now click on the right arrow. We're going to advance to the monthly costs area. And you can see that because we use those factor percentages, it copied them over for us. We've got the correct dollar amounts corresponding to this lo new loan amount. And our MI is already populated for us. So we, we've now got two loans against each other very quickly. Now let's add one more product. So click Add Another Product. And for this one, we're going to call this FHA 30 Fixed 320K. So everybody type that in on the product name, FHA, space 30, space FXD, space 320K. 
Now you'll notice that when I do this, I'm using a lot of acronyms. I'm shortening all the names as much as I possibly can. And if you want to know the reason for this, hover your mouse over that product name and you'll see that there's a little pop-up tip that's going to pop for you. And it tells you that while you can have a, a fairly long name on the live presentation, if you expect somebody to print this out, try and keep it under about 12 characters total for best results in print. There's a finite amount of space on the print job. So if you put too long of a product name and they print it, it's actually going to push some of your later products out of view in print. So it's always a good idea when you prepare one of these presentations, if you expect it to be printed, do a print preview yourself so you can see what it looks like. If you're finding that one of your columns is kind of being pushed out of the way, your product names are a bit too long. Try shortening them just a tad. All right, now I'm going to show you what the power of that template was that we just saved. So we're going to leave the refi toggle unchecked. And in the add product from template line, I'd like you to hit the drop down there. And I'd like you to select your 30 fixed FHA. So FHA 30 fixed. If you've already got templates, it's in the very bottom of your list. So click on that one. And you'll see that it brought in everything but left the purchase price blank for you. So for the purchase price, I'd like you to enter $320,000. Now if you hit the right arrow, check it out. It brought in all your fees. It brought everything that comes with this template, including the upfront MIP. It's kind of like doing the copy button, but you can use this without having a product on your report yet. So uh, what we're going to need to do is we need to go into our closing cost detail now. So everybody click on closing cost detail. And we're going to update those hazard insurance reserves and tax reserves. So scroll down the list just a tad. And uh, we're going to make the hazard insurance reserves 300. And our tax reserves, we're going to put 900 there. Now hit apply to loan. And then hit your right arrow. And the one thing it didn't bring across was my hazard insurance and property taxes here. So this actually looks like it's something in the system I need to have our developers look at because it should have brought those in for me. I think it's because I did it at, on the same presentation where I saved the template. But future ones, it would bring it in for me. But I'll, I'll make sure and get that addressed. For today's, go ahead and click on the percentage next to hazard insurance. And we're going to mark that with 0.35. Then on the property tax, click the percentage button pop in 1.25 or if you know your percentage go ahead and put that in there now click on the percentage sign next to mortgage insurance type in 1.35 and our calc on balance line is already there our MI cutoffs are there so we don't need to do anything more now click on the right arrow so here we are at the analysis summary screen. Now what this is for is this gives you a way to eyeball this presentation before you, before you even produce a preview of it. Just so you can have an idea of what these loans look like against each other and you can advise reinvestment strategies. So I'd like everybody to click on the adjust reinvestment strategy button. Now in the grid that pops up you'll see that there's all three loans are listed and it shows you the monthly difference between them up at the top in green so on the FHA 30 fix that's the 300 K1 it's hundred and forty seven dollars less than that that FHA 320 that's the one in red now the one that's being used as the benchmark for comparison is always going to be in red there now the reason I point this out to you is because we want to make sure that we account for the difference in money we want to show an apples to apples look at these different products now in order to do that, I'd like you to take a look at the middle section of this grid where it says accumulation. You'll see that we have a savings balance there and it shows that 20 grand. That was the 20 grand we put in the affordability screen. That's their current savings account. Now the next line is the cash to close and you can see that these ones have varying amounts of cash to close that are required. That is subtracted from their current savings and you get a new adjusted savings start. So that's what that third line in the grid is. That's showing what does their savings account look like after they've closed? We see the rate of return that we entered back in the, in the affordability section. And if you look down at the savings in 15 years, that's the yellow line, just a couple of lines below, you'll see that that savings is continue to, it's continuing to grow. Not by much because it's a very small percentage rate, but it is continuing to grow. 
Now, the payment boxes is what I really want to draw your attention to. If we want to level this out and assume the exact same cash flow between all three options, we need to make sure and plug in that monthly figure. So what I'd like you to do on the payment line for the FHA 30 fixed, I'd like you to type in 147.72. And you can see that that increases the savings pretty dramatically at the 15-year point. Now let's go over to the second column, the FHA 30 fixed 310K. For that one, it's, there's only a difference of 73.85 per month, so type in 73.85. And you can see at that one, they've got 18.7 in the bank. Now, we know that the FHA 30 fixed 320 is the highest cost program because it's the highest loan amount, which also means that they're not going to have any monthly extra savings that they can put back into their savings account. But what we've done here is we've shown an apples-to-apples -apples look at the total payment that they would pay every month. If they got the 320 house, they're going to pay this 2363. That's the pity payment up towards the top. We look at the other options, their pity payments are lower, so we need to account for the difference of that. That's why we put it in the savings payment line. Now, the section below that is the investment balance. So that's if you wanted to put this money into a new investment vehicle, particularly useful for when you're working with a CPA or financial planner that has told you they can get a good portfolio on this. Same general type of options. What we would do is instead of putting that 147.72 in the savings line, we'd actually put it down in the investment payment line and give it a good rate of return so that we could get a better, basically more money out of it going through that financial planner. For today's discussion, however, we're not going to enter that. Now, you, you also probably notice at the very top, there's a reduction payment line. Now, the reduction payment is, what if we took that extra money and put it straight back into the loan every month? So that is certainly a valid option, and, you know, the whole day, the, 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 Dave Ramsey approach is, you know, paid off as soon as possible. And if you're focusing on that type of strategy, you may want to earmark this money to go back into principal every month instead of back into their bank account. So up to you. But if you do put something in there, it's actually going to reduce their freedom point by, by whatever you put. So what I'd like you to do, just so you can see what it looks like, is on the FHA 30 fixed, I'd like you to erase the 147.72 that you have down in the savings area. So you can type a zero over it. And then up in the reduction payment line, it's like maybe six fields up, type in that 147.72, and then hit the tab button on your keyboard. And watch what happens to the freedom point on that loan. That loan now pays off in 25 years because you're taking that 147.72 and putting it back into the principal every month. So that's, that's one option. You can certainly do it either way. Uh, for uniformity on today's discussion, I'd like you to remove it from that reduction payment line again and you're going to put it back in the savings, savings payment line. All right, so now you should see that your freedom points are all the same. They're all 30 years, but you should see some pretty good nest eggs developing in that 15-year savings area. Tony's question real quick is, are these training sessions recorded, and where can I find them? Absolutely, Tony. They are recorded, and I'll show you that in just a couple of minutes here. I know we're getting close to the end, uh, but... I'll, I'll definitely touch on that for you. So since we're done with the investment grid, I'd like everybody to hit the OK button down at the very bottom right of the window you're on. And we're going to kind of zip through these last couple of fields here. So everybody hit the right arrow on your analysis summary screen. Now this is where we ask for the borrower's more detailed contact information. We didn't collect this at the beginning because we modeled this after an application process. When you're talking to your client for the first time over the phone, the first thing you're asking them is not, what's your phone, what's your work phone, what's your fax, what's your cell phone, uh, what's the property address. You want to first isolate what their goals are, and then you collect this towards the end. All right, so for today's discussion, all we're going to enter is the property address. For the street address, I'd like you to put in 123 Main Street. And then for the city, let's try any town. And the state, type a C and make it California. And then for the zip code, use 91111. Hopefully you guys are done entering that. Then go ahead and click the right arrow. Now by default, it selects the total cost analysis for you, and that's what we definitely want to show. 
Now you'll notice that there's check boxes right in the middle of the screen that allow you to check or uncheck any of the products. If you uncheck one of them, it won't show up on your presentation anymore. So if you've already sent this, this uh, presentation to your client and you said, you know what, I just can't afford that 321, can I look at just the 300 and the 310? Absolutely. Come back into this particular presentation screen, uncheck that FHA 30 320, and once you hit the right arrow, it'll, be, it'll actually be removed from the live report. All right, so let's discuss payment notes real quick. These are very important for compliance. Uh, the payment notes will appear directly beneath your, PNA, or your, your PITI payment on your presentations, but they'll have double asterisks that are, that are right next to them, and there will also be double, double asterisks next to the payment. So we want to indicate things like whether the taxes and insurance are included. So I am going to modify mine to say taxes and insurance are included in the payment. So I'd like you to take a moment and do that as well. And Teresa had a question. She says, does it work to split it out into 12s? I assume you're talking about the, uh, the accumulation line, and that would be customized accumulation, which you certainly can do. Um, we're not going to touch on customization today, but if you go to the help section and type in custom, uh, you'll, you'll see that there's actually a video specifically devoted to customizing your, your reinvestments. Check that one out when you get a moment. It's only about, I, I want to say, seven or eight minutes long, but it'll give you the full detail on how to do things like lump sum payments at different points uh, for, for any of those reinvestments, whether it's the term reduction, savings, or, uh, or, or an investment strategy. All right, so hopefully everybody's got your payment notes in there, and I'd like you to click on the right arrow, please. Now this gives you an option to modify the verbiage that appears behind the more info sections on your live report. If you wanted to, you could modify the text here. For today's discussion, we're just going to keep arrowing through. So I'd like you to hit the right arrow, and you'll see you're in now the 60-month area. So click on the right arrow one more time. And this is going to show you the long-term analysis. And it's selected as total interest and MI paid. But I'd like you to see what happens if you change it to total net worth. So everybody click on the total net worth button. And look what we have here. Now, the total net worth, the way it's going to show on your report, is the total equity at this 15-year period plus any liquid assets you've developed for them. Now, naturally, if we didn't show a reinvestment of that monthly payment difference into the savings account, the FHA 30 fixed 320K would have the highest net worth. And the reason is it's a higher-valued property. They're going to have more equity at that 15-year point. But because we did an even cash flow analysis on this and showed that monthly savings going back into their savings account, you can see that the net worth is actually highest on the lowest cost option because they've been socking that money away every month. So go ahead and toggle it back over to total interest and MI paid. That's usually going to be your primary indicator. And then hit the right arrow. Now this is the last screen of the presentation. You want to make sure that the Notify Me box is checked. If you'd like to use the Click to Call feature, you would enable the Call button. I'm going to disable it for this one. Usually, you're only going to lead, use that for lead capture on marketing reports. But I'd like you to check the box to send an Edge View Alert to the partner. Now, you note that this box won't show up if you have not entered the address back in the client screen for your partner email. I had everybody do it, so it should be showing you on your screen right now. The last thing we need to do is select a quote date. So click the little calendar icon next to the quote date, and it should default to May 1st, but then click on that actual date. So click on the one. And now we're going to hit the Generate Link button. Now once you've got that link open, it should, should generate one for you that says mcedge.tv forward slash and then some numbers. I'd like you to take your mouse and select that entire link right-click on it, and hit Copy. Then you're going to jump over to your email client, so Outlook, Gmail, whatever you're using, and you're going to start a brand new email. I'd like you to address it to support at mortgagecoach.com. Then on the CC line, if you want to CC yourself and, and use your Edge address for this one so you get it direct, go ahead and put your Edge email there. Now for the subject line, put in something like your purchase options. It doesn't have to be real, real uh, rosy, but this is just going to be a sample email that you're going to send to us so we can verify you were able to get through this presentation. Then in the body of the email, I'd like you to type in, hi Jacob, comma, please click on the link below 
to view your personalized Edge presentation. I'll give you a second to type that in. Again, that was please click on the link below to view your personalized Edge presentation. Then put a colon and hit the enter button to go to the next line. I'll type that in with you. Now, once you're on the next line there, you can either hit Control V on your keyboard to paste, or you can literally right click with your mouse and hit paste, and you can paste it in. And this is going to paste your edge link in there. After it's pasted in, hit the Enter key on your keyboard, and you'll see that it underlines it and makes it look like a link. Now, I'd like you to hit Send. So go ahead and send it to support at mortgagecoach.com. And everybody hit send. And that's going to go over to our support system. And what I'll do is when they come through the support system after the call today, I'm going to check out your reports, just make sure you got everything in there correctly. And then I'm going to respond to you to let you know, okay, great job. You know, here's some things that were missing. Here's, here's what you did really well. Uh, but your next steps will be to put a video behind it. So I'm going to give you some pointers on what to do with the video so you can continue to work on this sample file so you can get comfortable with this and be able to use this kind of strategy with the borrower. All right, so everybody hit the close button on that uh, generate link area. And now we're going to answer a couple of the questions that, uh, that some of our people had here. One was, how do you delete or edit the templates? So what I'd like you to do is click on the settings button at the very top in Edge. And you'll see that there's product templates and fee templates. Now if you click on the product templates tab, you'll see I've got a ton of them in there. You should only have one of them in there if you're brand new. If, if you already have a bunch of templates like Brian does, um, scroll down to the very bottom, Brian, and you'll find the one that we created today. If you want to delete a template, all you do is left click on that template and then hit the delete button over on the right side. Now, you, alternatively, when you left click on this template, you can just edit this particular template if you'd like. Say, for instance, the monthly closing costs. You can come in here and edit whatever you need to, hit OK. And then as soon as you click on any other template, it automatically saves your data. Now the same thing applies for fee templates. If you've got a bunch of bunk fee templates in there that you need to get rid of, I'd like everybody to click on the fee templates tab. This is going to pull up all the fee templates that you have in your file. And you can see I have a bunch of samples in here. But if you wanted to delete one of these, you would simply left click on the one you want to delete, then hit the delete button down in the lower part of the screen. Now alternatively, you can edit these particular line items. So you don't have to necessarily delete it. If you wanted to just modify it to be more useful for you, you could do that in here. Now one more thing I want to draw your attention to is the very bottom left. There's a button called Fees. Now what this is, is this allows you to get rid of custom fees that you've created. You can see I've created lender credit like eight times here. I need to get rid of some of those fees because my fee list is going to be phenomenal here. So if I wanted to delete one of them, I'm simply going to left click on that particular one, hit the delete button. It's going to ask me if I'm sure, and I can hit yes, and it'll delete that fee. So this is going to help you uh, pull back your, your, your fee list so it's not eight miles long with a bunch of duplicate fees. So go ahead and hit OK there to close out of that screen. And let's see, there was a couple more questions. And I know we're a little bit over, guys. Sorry about that. I will try and wrap this up right now. Uh, Tony's question about, are these training sessions recorded? Yes, absolutely. In order to find these, click on the Help button inside Edge. So everybody click on Help, please. Now this is going to take you over to our Knowledge Base. Now the Knowledge Base is where you find all the training videos, you know, as I, uh, as I talked about earlier with Teresa on customizing reduction payments, uh, if you wanted to find out how to do a custom reduction schedule, type in custom there, and it's probably in more. And actually, I'm going to type in reinvestment. I think that's going to be a better search for me. There we go. So how to use edge reinvestment strategies. And if we click more there, uh, how to customize your reinvestment strategies. That's the one that actually I'd like you to check out, Teresa, uh, just so you can see how that's done. But to answer Tony's question, there's a link at the very top here. It says click here to access our coaching call archive. I'd like everybody to click on that, please. 
And you'll see that uh, there's the sign-up areas at the very top where you can sign up for the Tuesday and Thursday calls. And then I have archived every single call for the last couple of years. So uh, you can see here that in April, our most recent coaching call on Tuesday, that's the Glenn Bill call that we just had. And then I'm going to start a new category today called May 2014. And today's Thursday training session will be in here. Uh, for instance, last week's, this is the Thursday training session we did last week on, on creating multi-scenario templates. Uh, so just keep in mind, it's all here for you. Uh, this is a kind of a cool note. Uh, you can actually do this on any website, but I'd like everybody to hold down the control button on your keyboard and hit F. And you're going to see at the very top of your screen, there's now something where you can search. So if you wanted to isolate, say, any call that has Jeremy Forcier in it, type in Forcier, F-O-R-C-I-E-R, -E and then hit the Enter button. And now you'll see that it, it's now highlighted the ones that have Jeremy Forcier in it. So if I wanted to find those specific ones, I can search by keyword here. So just a quick tip on how to search these archives because it's difficult to, to really isolate what you're looking for unless you type in a strategy to look for it, unless you want to read all the entries, but that's completely up to you. Uh, this will just be a little bit faster way to do it. Now additionally, beyond these, uh, these coaching call archives, if you want to see what other people have been doing, go, go back up and click on strategies up at the very top left of your screen. This is going to take you to all the strategies that are available. And you can see that the Coaching Call Archive is at the very top. The second one is the Edge Hall of Fame. I'd like you to click on Edge Hall of Fame. Now this should bring up a page that is showing you people's images and you can actually view their specific edge reports. So uh, for instance, Robert Anderson over at Churchill did one called Your Mortgage Insurance Options. It's a really good one. Check it out. It shows you the different ideas behind lender paid versus borrower paid. Uh, you can check out Tim Lamb's Cost of Waiting. does a real good job with that. Uh, Hans Bruner, this is a good one, Should I Pay MI? Very similar to what we saw with Robert Anderson, but he had a couple of different strategies in mind. We go all the way through. we got things like HARP 2.0 refis. We have uh, Clark's Loan GPS report. And that's just a personalized name that he chose for this type of strategy. You've got points versus no points, down payment and MI options, purchase options. Uh, refi options. There's even a couple in here that are like, actually I would advise you check this one out. Will Rudloff does a great job with these open house presentations. Uh, this is a co-branded listing presentation. You can check out his, his Edge presentation and the video and uh, that would be a good one to try and emulate your, your tones after. He's, he's really good at, at uh, keeping a nice solid tone and eye contact through the entire video. Uh, but if you want a couple of cool strategies that have just recently come out, uh, this one down here at the bottom from Thomas Popson, he did a great job on just a totally different spin on this. He says, is FHA right for the Simpsons? And he made it all about the Simpsons. It's a really cool idea that uh, I think can help gain traction. Uh, Brad Loudon also had a great cost of waiting presentation. The video is phenomenal uh, if you want to check that one out. But with all that being said, it looks like we've got everything knocked out for today. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the call. Uh, we will be here again next Thursday doing the same type of thing. But if you have an idea on a specific type of presentation that you'd like to see, shoot us a note over at support. Let us know what you'd like to see, and we'll make sure and cover that for next week. With that said, everyone, have a wonderful day. And uh, if you haven't sent those reports over to support, please do send those emails, and we will get back to you and just you know let you know your progress and tell you some next steps. But again, thank you very much for attending, and I hope to see you all next week. This will be in our Coaching Call archive by the end of the day today. Thanks. Take care, everyone.